Good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Good. Yeah, I'm here. That that's true. Sometimes that's all you can be, huh? Let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and pray, and then uh, we will start uh, this morning's lesson. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you, God, that uh, as we read it, Lord, we know more concerning you, uh, no more concerning us and, and how we are to view just history. We pray, God, that this would be an instructive time, an encouraging time, Lord, and that uh, you overall would be uh, glorified as we seek to understand your word and look through it. We love you so much. It's in your son's name. Amen. So uh, this uh, this morning, we will be taking a look at just one uh, particular verse from Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Thank you guys for tuning online here as well. Um, last week, we had discussed a uh, couple things. We had discussed uh, those, uh, the Church of Philadelphia, and some of the struggles that they were uh, experiencing as a result of uh, their being in this particular region. Um, we talked about uh, that uh, Jesus knows their deeds and that they had little influence in the culture that they lived in. That uh, even though they were believers and they trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of sins, we see that uh, they had little influence, little sway, little power in the culture. However, uh, they kept God's word. They held it in high regard, in esteem. Um, because of that, they have uh, received a certain promise from Jesus, which is that uh, those who are giving them trouble, that is some of the Jewish leaders, uh, the Judaizers and all those things, that he says that he will make them come and bow down before them and make them know that he loved them. And that love is not uh, something that, uh, uh, that, you know, it's not because they're so great, the, 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 the saints of uh of Philadelphia, but it's because of the agape, the love that they that he has for them by way of the message and their belief in that message. And of course, when he does this, it underscores the fact that his word is true, right? Now we turn our attention to Revelation chapter 10, uh, or Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Which says this, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. If you were to read uh, certain commentaries, maybe even certain books, there's been much ink spilled on this one verse. Tons of it. Um, um, there are some that believe that this is a rapture passage. There are some that believe that this is a uh, this isn't a rapture passage. There's some that uh argue that uh, this is a uh, uh, full stop, uh, the uh, argument that uh, the church will go through the tribulation and they'll be kept from it. Um, we'll try and see if we can't unpack this this morning. Let's look at a couple of uh, comments on this, by the way, since we're talking about some of what uh, people have said about this particular verse. Um, here's one uh, particular uh, comment on this passage. It says, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation. It says, Philadelphia was the last of all the seven cities here spoken of, which fell into the hands of the Turks. For whereas the rest were subdued by Orakan and Umarat, Philadelphia held out till the time of Bajaet, so that the remains of the society were preserved when those of the rest were ruined. The hour of temptation should come upon all the world, according to some, relates unto the persecution of Trajan, which was greater and more extensive than the preceding persecutions under Nero and Domitian. So uh, Trajan was, a, uh, was an emperor who basically uh, persecuted Christians after the time of Domitian. Okay. So that's one comment from this particular uh, commentator on this passage. Here's another one, um, another commentator who writes this. And there is the great promise which they believe and hope for 
the coming of himself to keep them out of the great tribulation. In Philadelphia, there is a revival of prophetic truth and earnest waiting for the coming of the Lord. Philadelphia is not a defined church period, but rather a description of a loyal remnant called out by the Spirit of God and bearing final testimony to the whole counsel of God by word and deed. If the reader desires to please the Lord, then study the details of the message to Philadelphia and walk accordingly. So this gentleman here uh, takes this, uh, essentially, if you want to be part of the remnant um, that is going to uh, come out of the great tribulation, well, then you best to heed his word and the details that are found according to the Church of Philadelphia and walk accordingly. He uses this as a prescriptive text. There's uh, another uh, perspective on this particular uh, um, uh, on this particular verse uh, that I talked about at length. It's the post-tribulation perspective. The post-tribulation perspective is the perspective that the church is going to go through the entire seven-year period um, on earth okay, uh, before Christ appears. It's your good old friend. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, your, it's your best friend. Yeah. Here uh, he writes here, uh, some contend that as God protected the church of Philadelphia from temptations that would come upon the whole world, so shall he protect us from the great tribulation. This passage was simply a message to the Philadelphian church that John had oversight of after he was released uh, from the exile on the Isle of Patmos. A similar message was written to the church of Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. The devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried. Excuse me. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, that he may be tried and that ye shall have tribulation for 10 days. Does this mean that the great tribulation will only last 10 days? Of course not. Again, this is a message to one of the seven churches of Asia Minor, which John uh, would oversee after his release from the exile. So again, we, we have this post-tribulation perspective that the church at large will go through the tribulation. And he connects this to Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, concerning that the devil shall cast some of them into prison, concerning the, the church of Smyrna, and says it's, it's, a, it's going to be akin or similar to that, but on a grand scale. So here's what we have so far concerning the, the, the comments that we looked at previously uh, that we've just done. One is the persecution of Trajan, which was greater than Nero and Domitian. Okay? Um, we'll talk about Domitian when we get to the church of Laodicea, matter of fact. Um, it could mean the loyal remnant of the faithful believers in Philadelphia, right? That uh, those who have uh, conducted themselves in a manner worthy um, of God will be, uh, 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 they get to skip, right? The great tribulation according to uh, one person's comments. And that and another one is this is the this was relegated to the saints of Philly concerning uh, the church of Philly that John had charge of. Now, what's interesting about uh, uh, Mr. Henry's comments is that he tells you uh, what it says. It's pretty plain, but he doesn't tell you what it means. He just tells you what it says, but not what it means in light of the overall context. So let's go ahead and uh, uh, break this down a little bit and take a look at some of the uh, words here. And then we will uh, uh, piece this together and then try to make sense of all that, of all this going on. So uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 10 starts off as, I will keep you from the hour of testing. We've seen this word, tereo, before, right? It means to keep. To heed some in senses, it means to guard, okay? And we've went through this, uh, this, uh, this uh, word at length, okay? Uh, this word is in the future active indicative, which means uh, that it's future and that the person who is the subject talking is doing the action 
And this is a statement of reality. This is something that's going to happen. This action by Jesus hinges on what Jesus said before this. Okay? And we saw we see this in verse 9. Okay? It says, Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and they are not, but lie. I will make you, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and let and make them know that I have loved you because you've kept the word of my perseverance, which is what he says in verse 8. Right? I will also keep you from the hour of testing. Okay. So the fact that they've been kept, right, that they've kept his word, he will keep them. It's pretty simple. So when it comes to uh, chapter three, verse nine, or chapter three, verse 10, rather, there are, there are a couple of things to note. There are some theologians out there, and again, Bible scholars, who would argue that the body of Christ will be in the seven-year tribulation, as I just mentioned, or believers will be taken out in the middle, that is, mid-tribulation, or and that the church will endure the fierce and harsh tribulation throughout this period. Many prominent uh, Bible scholars and teachers endorse this view, and those who endorse a uh, a preview or pre-trib view, they would say that we are, um, um, we've been tainted by the American gospel, that we have cushy, cushy lives and we want to maintain that. They are, that's one of their arguments for that, that the church has been persecuted throughout uh, its entire inception, and yet uh, they believe that uh, we are theologically, not only theologically lazy, but apathetic to the affliction that goes on around the world as a result of the country that which we live. Well, let's take a look at a couple of comments here. Um, this is sort of a mid-tribulation perspective because this individual believes not that this is the church, but that these are a bunch of uh, Jews or, or Hebrews essentially belonging to Israel that is going to go through the tribulation. This individual says this, this phrase in verse 10 does not refer to the tribulation period as such. It refers to a specific period of time, probably short within the tribulation period itself. And this time will be at the middle of the week when Antichrist will proclaim himself as God when sitting in the temple of God. This event will electrify the world. It will be reported in the newspapers. It will be a tremendous temptation for the Jewish remnant to worship him. Notice the language here. To think of him as the long promised Messiah come back to rule the earth. But God is going to keep his people from worshiping the Antichrist. He will fulfill his promise and keep them from that hour of temptation. The greatest temptation the Jewish believers will have to face. Many from the Gentile nations will worship the Antichrist as predicted in Revelation 13, 8. So again, this individual here who writes associates this church, this particular congregation, this assembly with those uh, in the middle of the tribulation. And while the earth is uh, being deceived by this individual who was coming, um, this remnant, according to this commentator, will not uh, they will be kept from being deceived by uh, the Antichrist. We have another post-trib perspective here. It says, some contend uh, that as God protected the church of Philadelphia, uh, oh, it's the same, this is the same one. So he shall protect us from the great tribulation. Again, this passage was simply a message to the uh, Philadelphian church that John had oversight of after he was released from exile on the island of Patmos. Again, we had covered this uh, already previously before. There's also another perspective too. Man, so many, right? So many, man. I'm just throwing them out here this morning. Uh, there's also another perspective called the Amel. This is also known as realized millennialism, as some would rather would like to call it. These individuals believe that there is no, there's going to be no literal thousand year 
reign of Christ, but that Christ is already uh, seated at the heavens and reigning up there, and that the thousand year reign is all symbolic, that we're in it right now, okay? And that what we are looking forward to next is the inauguration of the eternal state, of the eternal age. Christ will return. He will judge the living and the dead. He will uh, renew the earth. Uh, the new Jerusalem will come down, so on and so forth. And that will be uh, that. And then the start of the uh, eternal age will commence. We will cover the uh, all millennial uh, perspective in the next several weeks. Uh, too, when dealing with uh, some of the promises that Philadelphia gets at the end to those who overcome. But until that time, let's take a look at what this gentleman says here. In the ret in return of the Lord, in return of the Lord, out of his great mercy, promises to keep them that are his from the great temptations of the last days of the world. When false Christ and false prophets, not to speak of Antichrist himself, would arise and fight against the army of Christ. The last hour would be a fierce and evil period, a time of proving, of testing out the true believers in the fires of many tribulations and distresses. In the midst of these trials, the Lord promises to keep them that are his. No man can pluck them out of his hand. So in the amillennial perspective, there's going to be uh, a, a rumbling in the uh, the rumbly and the tumbly, right, affliction. And it will get worse and before it gets better. And before Christ appears, it's going to be utter chaos. And the Christians are going to find themselves in the middle of that before Christ appears to enter in the eternal state. He also mentions that the Lord will keep those that are his. And that no man can snatch or pluck him out of his hand, which is a reference to, uh, I believe, the Gospel of John. So we will come back uh, to these comments later. Okay, but there's some work we have to do here concerning this passage. So let's go ahead and uh, keep this going here. So I will keep thee from the hour of testing. Uh, the Greek phrase for hour is aura. Okay. It can mean hour. In some cases, it can mean season or moment. All right. Um, it can mean a specific hour as well as stated in Luke chapter 14, verse 17. Um, and this is especially true when this is connected to a number like it was a, a, it was around the sixth hour or it was around the ninth hour. Okay. So it can mean season. It can mean a moment or a period of time, or a definitive hour of time. It can also mean an aspect of time connected to an event. For instance, if we turn to John chapter 4, verse 21 to 23, I'll start at verse 17 for some immediate context here. It says, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are correct. You correctly said, I have no husband, for you already have five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you said truly. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on, on this, in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem, you will worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, the salvation of the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So Jesus uses this, this particular word here to speak about an aspect of time that's coming where worshipers won't worship on the Mount of Gazarim, where this uh, where he's pointing, nor in Jerusalem, but that they will worship this with the Father in spirit and in truth. 
right? We see this in John 17 as well. This word used particularly to uh, concern a particular aspect. Before Jesus is crucified, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and we have an opportunity to hear Jesus praying. This is one of the rare occasions where we actually hear him praying, where he's gone off to pray. He has the disciples with him, and so he's gone off a distance to pray to the Father. And he says this, Jesus spoke these things, lifting up his eyes to heaven. And he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Again, concerning his death. So we see that this, uh, this hour here of testing, specifically uh, when it's, uh, if it doesn't have a number associated with it, it could mean a particular time, a moment, it could refer to as a season. Testing. You know that this is, I kind of have some difficulty with this word because when we hear the word testing, I think of sitting down for an exam. Right. I guess it's because since I work at an, at an educational institution, that's the only thing I see here. Right. This word is also translated as temptation as well in various other uh, uh, versions of the scripture. And again, I have a hard time with that because my perspective here is uh, when I heard of temptation, I'm always thinking about sin. But that's not really what's going on here. The word uh, uh, is periosmos. Periosmos. It's used 21 times in the New Testament. And uh, this is the only time this word in this particular form, in this verse, is used in the book of Revelation. It is translated as temptations, trial, or testing. And again, I, I, I'm kind of lost on the on the observation of this word because i'm looking at this word from a particular perspective right temptations don't necessarily always mean at least according to uh, the vernacular that's used and translated in various versions um uh sin same thing with trial when i talk when i when someone talks about a trial i usually think about a courtroom right so what does this word periosmos mean? Well, we see this in various places throughout Scripture. As a matter of fact, let's turn to James chapter 1, and let's see if we can't look at, uh, try to get some clarity here. James, writing to uh, the Hebrew believers, the tribes scattered and dispersed abroad, the diaspora, he writes this. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who were dispersed abroad, greetings. It says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces perseverance or, pro or produces endurance. And then let endurance ha have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. We see the same word that's used in verse 12. It says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, we've, we've mentioned the crown of life before, right, in this various text. That the crown of life is a, associated with certain types of afflictions, persecutions, maybe even certain pressures. Now it seems we're getting some clarity here. We see this word used as well in 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 6, and chapter 4, verse 12. I will start at verse 3. It says, A blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of of Jesus Christ from the dead, an inheritance imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, excuse me, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, 
you rejoice, you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So we find that Peter, in the first in the introduction of his letter, is telling them who they are and the promises that they have that is reserved in heaven for them and, and acknowledges that they have this even though they have been put under great distress concerning various trials. It's almost exactly the same as James. We see this in chapter 4 as well, verse 12. It says, Beloved, I'll start at verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised or amazed at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that the revelation of glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. So we find the same word here that's used in verse in chapter four, verse 12. It's the same word that's used here in chapter four, chapter one, verse six concerning various distressing situations, pressures. Second Peter also mentions this word as well. Chapter two, verse nine. I will start at verse four. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness, reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would, would live ungodly lives thereafter, and if he rescued righteous lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, right? For by what he saw and heard that righteous men while living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by lawless deeds, then the, no, then the Lord knows how to rescue the ungodly from temptation. Again, that when I read that, I'm like, what? There's no sin being talked about here, it, it, at least as far as the righteous are concerned. What is he talking about? The, the, the context of 2 Peter is the, is the, uh, the pressures that surrounded Lot, that surrounded Noah, that surrounded all of these individuals. And to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Right? So some things to note. This word is usually associated with various pressures that come on to the saints. This is especially indicative of the Church of Philadelphia. Okay? The Church of Philadelphia is going through tremendous affliction. Right, especially at the hands of those who are uh, who are the Jewish teachers and the Jewish leaders. This pressure can also be associated with persecution, as we've seen in various other texts, right? Of 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 the churches of Revelation, Pergamum for one, Smyrna for another. This phrase is in its totality has two definite articles, the hour of the test or the trial. From the context so far, Jesus is stating to the saints of Philly that he would keep them from a specific time of pressure or calamity. That's what's going on here. To the context of those in 1 Peter and James, Christians all over the world experience trial and temptation, that is pressures. But it would appear that from this text, that they would be kept from this specific calamity. Interesting. Revelation chapter three, verse 10. I will keep you from the hour of testing that hour 
which is about to come upon the whole world. We see this word, which is about, is the word mellow, not, hey, I'm mellow. I'm doing all right. I'm mellow. Cat. This particular phrase is used concerning the concept of expectation. Okay? This is a present active participle. In this particular context, this is known as a genitive absolute. You can translate this as certainly. This is, this is a done deal. It's going to happen. Okay? This hour of intense, huge calamity will come, uh, will certainly come, right? Uh, we have the word erechoma here, uh, which is about to come. This word is translated just like this. It could be translated that hour, which is certainly to come. Okay. So this is an this is a a a period of time, a, a moment that is about to uh, uh, come on to the entire world or the whole world. This word is halas, the whole world. This word is, can be translated in various passages as all, completely, entire. This, is, this word is used 112 times in the New Testament in various contexts. And this word is used four times in the book of Revelation. Let's take a look. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. Verse 12, I'll start at verse 9. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judgment and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there is given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and the brethren who were to be killed even as they had been would be completed also. I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became as black as sackcloth, and the whole moon became like blood. So you could look out on this moon. John's looking out at this moon and seeing the whole entire moon looking as if it is blood. Revelation 12, 9 just a couple of pages over. And there was a war in heaven. I'll start at verse 7. And there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the entire world or the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth. His angels were thrown down with him. The, the one who deceives the entire world, who has influence on the whole earth, was thrown down. We see this in Revelation 13, 3, just a chapter over as well. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed, was amazed and followed after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, right, who was, who was, given, who was given the beast authority. So this one who had been slain, who had been slain, or is he acting as if he had been slain, is now uh, uh, amazed. The whole earth is amazed at this individual because it appears 
He is resurrected from the dead. Revelation chapter 16, verse 14. I'll start at verse 13. It says, and I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the great war of the great day or the, the great war or the, or the war of the great day of God, the almighty. So we find uh, Ahalas in this context is talking about the things in its entirety, right? That there isn't an inch where this thing, this word isn't used where it's where it's been affected, either influence or some type of phenomena. Okay? We see the world. This word in the Greek, oikoumene, coming from the word oikos, which means to dwell. And these two words together, alas, oikoumene, are found in two places, Revelation 12, 9 and 16, 14, which we just looked at, these two. Whole world. This word is in the genitive singular. One can translate this as the entire world's inhabitants or the whole world dwellers. These people in these in these people that, that live on this land, on this earth, in this place, dwell here. Okay? No, there's no place that you can go. You can go off to an island uh, off the Canaries, right? And it's still going to affect you. There's no place on the, in the world where the inhabitants dwell that is not going to be affected by this hour. To test, again, to test those who dwell on the earth. We've already talked about the word test here. We can translate this as affliction to, 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 to uh, 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 hardship, calamity, so on and so forth. This word dwell uh, comes from uh, the word according to an oika, to dwell. It's essentially adjectival, that is, the concerning the ones who are dwelling on the earth. Again, it's underscored in this text that this hour is going to concern those who dwell on the earth in contrast to those who are kept from this hour. Uh, this word is gay, and it's, uh, there are two things concerning uh, gay to those to test those who dwell on the earth. One is uh, this word is used in connection with a location. It could be discussing a particular location, especially if there's a name attached to it or a location attached to it, like Jerusalem, the land of Jerusalem or the land of Israel or something like that. OK, so this could be referred to as a particular location, locale, city, so on and so forth. But when it's used without a particular location or without a particular area or region, it usually underscores or references the entire globe. Okay. So again, it would seem from the text that this is not relegated to a particular region. It's not relegated to a particular city. It's not relegated to even a particular nation. But this is concerning the whole planet. Keep you from. This is an interesting one. We'll come. We've now swung back to the first part of verse ten, verse ten. It says, "I will keep you from the hour of testing." This Greek phrase is "tereso ek." Okay. It is translated 
in the Greek to keep you out of or keep from. Okay. Uh, this word that Jesus uses is significant. You know, words matter, right? Especially these words that are written that the, because John is basically recalling this as Jesus dictates to dictate it to him what to write. And so Jesus is not using superfluous words here. This isn't just a, you know, uh, just whatever you write down. This is this is important. Let's go ahead and take a look at this word. Let's go back to those to those comments and verses we skipped. Okay. So to record, so Sereso say ek, I will keep you out of or from, right? What Tereso say ek does not mean. What does it not mean? If it were, Iro say ek, it could mean take you out of or to take you from. It doesn't say that. It says keep you from, not take you out of. Okay. Nor does nor is this used either. Iro say apo, or to take you from, either. It doesn't say that. If it did say that, then this would be a good, clear case for mid-tribulation. Because if it did say that, then in order for Jesus to take them out of something, they would have to be in it. Does that make sense? But he says he will keep them out of or keep them from it. How about this one? Tereso say ek means to keep you out of. It does not mean Tereso say in, to keep you in. If this was the case, if this, if it said this, then that means, folks, you better buckle up tight because it's, it's going to be rough. But he doesn't say that. He says to keep you from this hour, not keep you in this hour that comes upon the whole earth. Fascinating. So what about the commentator's comments based upon what we just looked at just very briefly? Okay. The persecution of Trajan, do you remember that? that? That this was about the persecution of Trajan that was greater than Nero and Domitian. Well, that can't be true uh, because Trajan persecuted Christians. But that's not what the text says. It doesn't say that he's going to keep them in. It says he's going to keep them from the hour of testing that's to come upon the whole earth. As far as I know, from the history I saw, Trajan didn't uh, didn't persecute the entire world. The affliction didn't come up with the, across the entire world, not the saints. So it can't be that. What about the loyal remnant of the faithful believers in Philly? How about that one? It's got to be some uh, super secret special Christian, whatever. Well, it says nothing about a faithful remnant at all. In fact, it says that as this promise is made to the entire church of Philadelphia, there is nobody, nobody's wasted here. There isn't a, a, a Christians here and then there's a group of Christians that, that Jesus will keep them from. It doesn't say that. It's the entire fellowship. There is no distinction in the text. As was made in previous letters, we see that there's distinctions made in previous letters, but it's not here. Well, what about this one? This was relegated to the saints of Philly concerning the church of Philly that John was in charge of. Remember, good old, good old Willie B's best friend. Well, he gives the reader a detailed comment on the audience, but he doesn't comment on what these verses mean. He has no comment on that, which I I I think I thank him that he's being actually he's observing the text. But the problem is he just makes the same mistake as the other ones. What about the mid trip perspective? Well, we've already talked about this. The language doesn't bear this out. It doesn't say Tereso say in. 
He doesn't say to keep you in. This is not a mid-trip perspective because the words and the grammar here speaks of the prevention of the hour of testing. Not a removal from it. Okay? Again, we're just looking at the plain language here. No, no, no biggie. Post-trip. Well, we already talked about this. This is not a post-trip perspective. Because the words and grammar here speak in terms of the prevention of the hour of testing rather than the preservation. And you know what? I, I would bet, as a matter of fact, I'm going to put my chips on this, that this is one of the reasons why there is a specific religious perspective that endorses the perseverance of the saints. It's because they see this text as you need to stay in all the way. But it doesn't say that. And it doesn't make you more benevolent to hold this view either, okay? because it's not what it says. What about the all-mill perspective? Well, despite the fact that there's some uh, uh, twisted symbolism that we'll get to concerning the all-mill perspective, it's not an all-mill perspective because the words in the grammar here speaks of the terms of prevention of the hour of affliction or calamity or destruction or intense pressure that is to come on the earth, the entire earth. So to sum up here, it would appear that this aspect of time points to period where saints are kept they're held. Even though this verse is speaking to the saints of Philly, it would appear that by this verse, by extension, is a promise to all believers. Why? Because of the text that surrounds it. That's why. There's no point that the, the, the church of Philly uh, saw uh, this, this calamity, this intense pressure that came upon the earth. The specific language removes reality of it being mid-trib, Amil or post trip. It just removes that. And this event that occur is a certainty. It is certain to happen. It's not, it's not, it is, it is a done deal. The word temptation does not exactly fit this context in light of our culture today. I would, I would use the word pressure or calamity. This is something that's going to be unparalleled. Okay. This pressure or calamity comes as a result of the world, or at least these people being unbelievers. This is, this is something that's very different from what is, is being experienced today. Believers are being persecuted for being believers. They are not held from that. No believer is at this time. However, it would appear in the future, there is a time where a tense of calamity will happen and believers will be capped from that. Very clear. This pressure or calamity is used to demonstrate to the world that God is to be glorified. It would make no sense if this calamity is punishment to the world for them being unbelieving and God would punish his own people. That makes no sense especially if the point that God is making is that he be glorified. We already know this, and we acknowledge this. And it could be displayed in light of the rapture. That is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 6 to 19. There's no uh, blood and guts language in this text, but in the text that it used to talk about events that take place where believers are kept, it would seem that there's tons of blood and guts going on, destruction, uh, mayhem, calamity, pressure, adversity. I would, I would submit to you that this, uh, this text is indeed a pre-trib text because of the language that's being used here. The fact that, that believers are being kept from a specific hour of time where pressure will be so intense and it will be, there will be nowhere you can go, nowhere you can hide, nowhere you can go. You, can't, you couldn't go anywhere 
to escape this, the fact that it comes upon the planet in its totality. Well, on to verses 10 to 12. We're almost there. Okay, we're almost to chapter four. We, we didn't think we would make it, but we're almost there. Well, that's if I don't die in the next month or so. And then, then Will can have all my notes and stuff and, and, and continue on here. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and pray, and then uh, we, will, uh, we will close out this, this lesson here. Lord, thank you again so much for telling us of the hope that we have in you. That because we are believers in Christ and we trust in your word, that we will not be examined along with the world itself, that we will not have to go through the intense pressure. And it's not because we're so great. It's it's not even because um, in one sense uh, we're, we're trying to avoid calamity. It's not, not that we're asking for it, um, but Lord, uh, uh, we, we, we understand this because your word is true. It's what it says. And we believe that. Lord, we thank you so much, Lord, for the clarity um, and the uh, and the uh, hope that this gives us as believers. May we continue, uh, Lord, to uh, trust in you, to uh, trust in your word, uh, to be uh, concerned about what it says and to allow our uh, uh, your word to influence everything that we do and say. We love you so much, Lord, and we give you due praise. For it's in your son's name. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.